Our reading from Scripture this morning is found in Leviticus 24. Leviticus chapter 24. Leviticus, as you can tell by its very name, is the revelation that God gave to Moses concerning laws, all kinds of laws, especially the ceremonial laws. But a couple of times in this book, there's history, and this chapter conveys one, of, one incident in the history of the children of Israel. Leviticus 24. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil olive beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually. Without the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation shall Aaron order it from evening unto the morning before the Lord continually. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. He shall order the lamps upon the pure candlestick before the Lord continually. And thou shalt take five fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof. Two tenths deals shall be in one cake. And thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row upon the pure table before the Lord. And thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place. For it is most holy unto him of the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. And the son of an Israelitish woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel. And this son of the Israelitish woman and a man of Israel strove together in the camp. And the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. And they brought him unto Moses And his mother's name was Shalomith, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in ward, that the mind of the Lord might be showed them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring forth him that hath cursed without the camp, and let all that heard him lay their hand upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well the stranger as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, which is shall be put to death. And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. And he that killeth a beast shall make it good, beast for beast. And if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him, breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. And he that killeth a beast he shall restore it, and he that killeth a man, he shall be put to death. Ye shall have one manner of law, as well for the stranger as for one of your own country, for I am the Lord your God. And Moses spake to the children of Israel that they should bring forth him that had cursed out of the camp, and stone him with stones. And the children of Israel did, as the Lord commanded Moses. So far we read from God's holy word. Just instead of rereading those verses that deal with the incident of the son of the Israelitish woman and Egyptian man, 
Notice a couple of things. First, in verse 11 and in verse 16, it simply says that he blasphemed the name. And notice that in both of those verses, 11 and 16, of the Lord, of Jehovah, is added in italics. But for the children of Israel, they didn't have to add that. They knew the name. We needed a little help. And hence, the editors of the King James Version added those three words, of the Lord. But they knew the seriousness of of the name. They knew what that meant. Secondly, notice that the Israelitish man who fought with him, strove with him, nothing said about him. Not because he was completely Israelite and the other one a half-breed, Egypt and Israel. No, that's not the reason. Nor why is dealt with. But the seriousness of the sin, of blaspheming the name, is what received all of the attention. Notice thirdly, that those who heard were guilty. They were as guilty as the individual who blasphemed. They only heard, we would say. They didn't do it. But they were called to transfer the guilt of their sin of hearing on the head of the one who did it. In the ceremonial laws, there were sins that were covered with sacrifices. And you could continue to live. There were other sins committed by elect that were not covered with sacrifices. And then there were sins that you were not only stoned for, but then your body was hung on a tree. Then you were cursed. Then the picture of excommunication and hell was pictured. This says nothing that he was stoned about his eternal state. But it does say everything about the seriousness of his sin. That's why we get the emphasis that we do here in Lord's Day 36 concerning the third commandment. What is required in the third commandment? That we, not only by cursing or perjury, but also by rash swearing, must not profane or abuse the name of God, nor nor by silence or connivance be partakers of these horrible sins in others. And briefly, that we use, now positively, the holy name of God no otherwise than with fear and reverence so that he may be rightly confessed and worshipped by us and be glorified in all our words and works. And now the wording of question of the question, 100, is as important as the answer. Is then the profaning of God's name by swearing and cursing so heinous a sin that his wrath is kindled against those who do not endeavor as much as in them lies to prevent and forbid such cursing and swearing? It undoubtedly is. For there is, you know, this is powerful words. There is no sin greater or more provoking to God than the profaning of his name. And therefore he has commanded this sin to be punished with death. 
honoring God's holy name. First of all, we consider what is meant by God's name. Secondly, we want to consider how we're to use it. And then thirdly, we want to consider the incentive that's given. And we can do that rather briefly when we simply realize the wording of the commandment that God will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. So first, what's meant by God's name? Usually we think, just as we have names, that those are either a handle, something our parents gave to us that gives us our own identity, or it's a title. That's it. That's a name. But we're going to see briefly by looking at the way the Bible uses that expression, the name especially the name of God, that it's a whole lot more than just a title. The name of God, the name, refers to everything that God reveals of himself. So the name of God equals the revelation that God has given of himself. Just stop right there. God reveals himself in many different ways, but all of them are the name of God. He has revealed himself so that we may know him, but so that we may not just know, but also honor him and glorify him as he's worthy of being honored and glorified. In his name, his revelation of himself will tell us how much glory and how much honor he's to be given. In the fifth Psalm, the 11th verse, just an example. Let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. Now, it doesn't say, let them that love thee. Now, maybe that's a bit implied, but it's not let them that love thee. Let them that love thy name be joyful in thee. You have something similar in Psalm 116, the 13th verse. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Call, could have said, I will call on the Lord. But I will call on the name of the Lord. I will call upon him as he's revealed himself to me. In the book of Deuteronomy, well, let's take, let's take it as it's in 2 Chronicles. In 2 Chronicles, the, the uh, name of God, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that one now. Let's do the, the, the Deuteronomy 16 one. The tabernacle and then the temple, the place where God says, I'm going to dwell among you. You want to meet me, then you come to where the Ark of the Covenant is inside this tent or this building, tabernacle, temple. In Deuteronomy 16, verse 2, Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God of the flock and of the herd in the place where the Lord shall choose to place his name there in the place where the Lord shall choose to place his name. That's where God is going to reveal himself. 
That's where, in a very special way, you can find him. Psalm 75 makes it rather broad in general. Unto thee do we give thanks, unto thee do we give thanks, for that thy name is near, thy wondrous works declare. God's works are a revelation of himself in creation. So when we think of God's name, yes, there are his proper names. And we've gone through an an identification and a definition of the name God. We've dealt with Jehovah. We've dealt with Lord. Those are his proper names. There's also God's titles, the titles that he in Scripture gives to himself. And those titles are also very clear revelations that he gives and tells us about him. Take, for example, the name or the title Almighty. Immediately, you got a picture of him. He reveals that he has every ounce of strength that you see. And if any human or anything else has strength, it's what has been given to them from the Almighty. Most High. Another title that's given to God, whereby He reveals something about Himself. Father of mercies. Holy One. Lord of hosts. Everlasting. Rock. Different titles. Everyone saying something about him. And when we, when we find them in the scriptures, then that name, that title, is to give an indication to us of him. Because God, in the revelation that he gives of himself in the scriptures, uses a specific name or title very purposefully. One of the most common ones that I've pointed out before that are really precious is we've been translated. We had King, we had Enoch, remember? Enoch? He was translated. Well, in order to understand that word translated, we looked at its use as that word is used in Colossians 1.13. And there it says, we've been translated from the kingdom of darkness from the, into the kingdom of... Now, it could say heaven, kingdom of God. But the language of Colossians 1 is into the kingdom of his dear son, or literally into the kingdom of the son of his love. Now, that tells us something about the kingdom. This is the realm where the son of God's love rules. We use this for a confession of faith at the request of one of the young people a few years ago. Ephesians 1, verse verse 6. We are accepted in Christ? No. In Jesus? No. In the Son of God? No. We are accepted in the Beloved. That's the name God gives of Jesus. We're accepted in that beloved. It's one thing to be accepted in Jesus. It's another thing to be accepted in Christ. But to be accepted in the beloved, that's what he wants us to focus on as he reveals himself that way. There are also attributes of God that are used in Genesis 32, 29, Exodus 3, 15, Exodus 15, verse 3. God's name is includes his attributes it includes his commandments it includes all of his works the best name for god the most clear revelation of god hebrews 1 tells us is jesus the very name thou shalt call his name jesus why What does Jesus mean? Children, you remember? Jesus. J-E. Jehovah. S-U-S. Saves. Jesus is the perfect revelation of the Father. Of Jehovah as he saves. 
And that's the way that we have to see Jesus. He's the revelation of God. Don't just focus on Jesus, but see him as the name of God. That's what all these names are there for. Or let's put it this way. God gives his names to us so that we are able to know him. First, know about him. We get to know about him. We get to know who he is. We get to know what he's done, what he is. But God's intent is not just to know about him, but truly to know him so that we'll love him as he loves us. He wants us to be able to speak about him. He wants us to be able to speak to him. He wants us to be able to pray to him. He wants us to be able to worship him. Those names enable us to do that. Look at God's revelation. Now, don't ever forget, we're going to hit that in a, maybe a month or two. When Jesus taught us to pray, the first request, the first petition of all six, that which has primacy in our, or what ought to have primacy in our prayers and in our life is, Hallowed be thy name. May the revelation that God has given of himself in his word, in his commandments, in his attributes, in his works, be holy. Be separate. Now that brings us to the second point, and that's how are we to use that name? First, in general, in a general way, we are to handle the names that God has given to us with awe. Godly fear with reverence. That's the way Hebrews 12, 28 puts it. With reverence and godly fear. Handle that name that revelation, as if it is special. Extremely special to you. Now, remember this. When the canons of Dort want to show to us that God gives the assurance of, to the elect, that they are elect, we may know we're go- we've been chosen by God from before the foundation of the world. By observing in ourselves not only true faith in God, Christ, not only godly sorrow, not only a hunger and thirsting after righteousness, but that second one that's listed that I jumped over is this, that we are able to find in ourselves what's called in the canons filial fear, childlike awe. God is so great and our understanding and approach to him is to be with such care that we are awed that we take the revelation that he's given of himself and we hold it up. It's special. Add to that this thought. Do you know who you are? Now we can say a lot of things. But we, the people of God, his children, have this, it, it, take that name, and that's, that's what declares him to be so special, so wonderful. You take that and then realize this. And I'm going to read Second Chronicles now. Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. 
Listen. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. That first part, which are called by my name. Everything that, that, let's do it this way. If you don't have awe and reverence to the degree that we don't hold that revelation that God has given of himself as special and high and awesome, you're not going to know yourself as he knows you. To the degree that you do, you will. Because God has taken his revelation and he's put it on you. So much and to such a degree has he put it on you that when that third commandment comes and he says, don't take the name, thou shalt not take the name, that word take is literally, thou shalt not carry the name of Jehovah thy God in vain. He, in saving, puts his name on you. We can figuratively say, when the water of baptism is on your head, you carry that name. When you go to work, and you're amongst all kinds of unbelievers, there you are. And you may never forget, I carry the name of Jehovah. When you're playing ball, doing any sport, Maybe around a table with dominoes. You're carrying the name. Your attitude with which you play. Anything. You are carrying the name. You can't get rid of it. It's as obvious to God as your nose right in the center of your face. He's put his name on you. And you carry it. Always. That's why improper conduct by God's people causes blasphemy to put on God. It, people don't mock us. Huh, you say you're a Christian? No, it puts blasphemy on God and on his word. His revelation of himself. And when you, when you conduct yourself correctly, you adorn the teachings of God, the doctrines. You dress it up. You put jewelry on it. It looks sharp. You carry the name. Now, our use... The negative way is this. We're forbidden to use the name in vain. Children, look. You see what I have in my hands? Can you see? Do you see anything right here? I got something. It's nothing. That's what the word vain means. To take something that is so vital, so important, and so awesome, and to make it nothing. Any use of God's name that makes it just a common word empties it of all of its meaning, makes it Nothing. Any neglect or casual use is prohibited of us because of the enormous weight and significance that that revelation of God has. So the catechism lists, lists, makes a list. Profanity, 
disregard for the honor and the holiness that's due to God. Cursing. Just this week, I heard somebody say, I don't even dare say it, H-E-L-L, no. Hell is God revealing himself in his anger. And nobody wants to abide there. But we take that revelation of God and we treat it common. Oh, we use it because we want to make emphatic something. But in do so, doing so, we empty it of its meaning. Years ago, I can remember older people saying, for heaven's sake. And it was just an expression that emptied the revelation of heaven, of God in heaven, of all of its meaning. Sadly, one of the most common ones for us is when we pray. And I just heard it again. And it makes me so very, very conscious because I do the same. In our prayers, we, the one that I heard was saying, Lord, just about in every petition. And the name was empty. It didn't fit what it was applied to and connected with and it was just said as something to buy just a millisecond so we could think of what to say next in a prayer. God has revealed himself. Now, now that's, it's, that's not the way we are to pray, but I don't want to make that one so huge. That, but we better be conscious of how we use his names. But it's not just the titles that God gives of himself. It's the whole of his revelation. That's the key. And, and as he's put it on you, it is to be holy. Holy means it's not common. That's why that restaurant, TGIF, thank God it's Friday. Sports people are, know about Harry Carey. He was known for saying an attribute of God applied to cows. And so right in front of him, for as long as he announced there was a wooden cow, somebody drilled holes in it because that was Harry Carey's way he was known. God was thrown right out the window. You know, that may be ways to condemn certain people, but beloved, I don't, I don't think he had God's name put on him, but you do. You and I carry that name. Don't carry it as if it doesn't mean anything. And that's what happens every time we forget. The honor the awesome honor that's yours as a child of God. So instead of using it in vain, we are to use it, again, that Hebrews 11 expression, with reverence and godly awe, godly fear. Let me suggest five ways. Very common one out of Joel 2 that's quoted in Romans 10. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That word call means you holler, you're desperate because you know and experience that as if you're drowning, you're burdened, you're weighted down, and you 
call whosoever shall call on the name of Jehovah. Why? Because when we look away from ourselves and know that like Peter, we're drowning and we can't do it anymore, we look to him and we take the revelation he's given and said, I will be with you. I will take care of you. I will help you. I will save you. We take his promises for their value's sake and we say, the name of Jehovah can save me. And we call on the name. We worship him by asking for his help. Those prayers honor him when we call on him for help. We worship him when we submit and subject ourselves to his commandments. Every one of these commandments tells us something about him. God wouldn't make the ten, except each one of them say who he and what he is. And so when we violate these commandments, we're touching him. The prodigal son and David, in their godly sorrow, said, My sin is that I touched God. Sure, I hurt other people. Sure, I embarrassed myself. But my sin is this, I touched God. Submitting ourselves to him in godly sorrow. Submitting ourselves by asking for the grace to do as he commanded. Submitting ourselves when he and his providence brings things into our lives. And we say, have thine own way, Lord. Do with me as thou wilt. Your Lord, I'm servant, I'm slave. We glorify him and honor that name by declaring what we know about him to others. When we talk about him with one another, when we witness about him, to others when we teach our children the importance of their awe for God and love for Him. We're glorifying and honoring that name that He has given. Fourth, we glorify Him and we honor that name by loving Him. Truly understanding what that love is, we love him. But one of the most frequent ways we can honor that name is by thanking him. Were you given the gift of sleep? Thank him. Could you awake as out of the dead? Thank him. And you put your legs out, maybe with pain, but you can do it. Can you see? Can you hear? Can you think? Thank him. Do you have any gifts? Thank him. Do you have opportunity today? Thank Him. Live in heartfelt gratitude because you are able to know Him and you have been privileged to carry that revelation that He gives of Himself. There's many other ways. Think of them. Don't take the name of God in vain. Now our incentive starts with that. First of all, the commandment is negative. 
Why negative? Why is it worded, thou shalt not? Why doesn't he say what we are to do? It's because he's coming to us. And just that he words it that way is a powerful reminder to us. What's my nature? I have to be told what not to do because that's what I'm always going to be inclined to do. So I'm a, I learn about the natural inclination from God's perspective of myself when he says, thou shalt not. But secondly, and even more powerful, it's worded this way, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in an empty way because God will not hold him guiltless. Again, kind of a strange way to say it. Why not simply say, because those who take his name in vain are guilty. Why does he say, not guiltless? Precisely because he knows that we live in a world that surrounds us and we have natures ourselves that are inclined to say, ah, not so serious. There are sins that are far more serious. But taking a part of God's revelation and making it a common use, that's not so bad. Come on, get real. Well, God says, I am real. And when you forget me all day because you're at work, busy, that's when you're supposed to remember me the most. And you think you can go through your work without me? When you forget the honor that is yours because I have put my revelation upon you and you carry my name, as it were, right on your head, in the middle of your face, and you treat it as if it's not so big, not guiltless, is a negative, double negative way in order that it can be brought to us powerfully. Guilty. Not little. Not so insignificant. It's horrible. And that's why the language of the catechism. No sin is more provoking to God. If you want to rank him, rank sins, then you have to put this one at the top. That's where God puts it. He does not reveal himself to us except that we hold it up and honor it. That we treat it as special, not common. That we never stop thanking him, praising him, glorifying that we live in that filial fear, that childlike awe. God is an awesome God. How great thou art. Great is thy faithfulness. God is good. Supremely everlastingly good. Know him. That's how he knows you. Amen. Our Father, we thank thee for the revelation that thou hast given of thyself. Why, why wouldst thou reveal thyself to us? except that we hold that revelation of Thee with the greatest honor. And why are we able to carry it? Why are we able to know Thee? 
Thou art under no obligation to give that revelation to anyone. So we to whom that revelation is given owe to thee eternal thanks. And we've not made ourselves to differ from the others to whom that revelation stares them in the face, but they hold it down in unrighteousness. Why is it that thou hast given us the ability to hold it with care and with godly fear? All grace. We thank Thee. Amen.